Good evening. My name is Bob Liff, and this is the CUNY Forum, a monthly town meeting that brings prominent New Yorkers together with faculty and students of the Edward T. Rogowski Internship Program in Government and Public Affairs. When Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito called for the closing of Rikers Island, she focused laser-like attention on the centerpiece of what many concede as a dysfunctional system of corrections that traps thousands of inmates, more than 80 percent of whom have not been convicted of a crime, in a system plagued by violence. The speaker named a blue ribbon panel chaired by New York's former top judge, Jonathan Lipman, that includes a who's who of experts in corrections, but not anyone from the city administration and not anyone from the corrections officers union. Their task is a broad one, as, the, as, as unraveling the knot of problems requires attention to such issues as the dilapidated conditions of the various facilities on Rikers, the fact that it costs tens of millions of dollars a year to transport inmates to courts around the city for hearings, the prevalence of gangs in, in, inside the institution, and the toxic environment not only between and among inmates, but between inmates and the staff that too often has gone overboard in trying to control their workplace. A great deal of attention has been focused on the need for bail reform, since so many of those inmates are there because they cannot afford to post bail that would free them until their court proceedings. These inmates, in essence, are being punished for being poor. That was tragically highlighted recently in the case of Khalif Browder, who was held on Rikers for three years without being convicted and eventually took his own life soon after being released. Inmates have been held in, in, in some cases for years awaiting court hearings and trials for crimes as serious as murder and rape or as minor as failing to answer a bench warrant for misdemeanors or even lower level offenses. Mayor, Mayor de Blasio's initial reaction to the proposal to close Rikers was skeptical at best, warning it would cost millions and millions of dollars and would likely uh, require the creation of or expansion of detention facilities in neighborhoods around the city in the home boroughs of the detainees. Corrections Union President Norman Seabrook, who points out his members patrol the city's toughest precincts, taunted those calling for closing Rikers, asking if, asking if new facilities would be located on Park Avenue on the Upper East Side. Police Commissioner Bratton called the proposal a fantasy. But Judge Lipman called for time to conduct a far-reaching independent investigation. We're joined by four New Yorkers to talk about the state of our jail system. Jacqueline McMickens, who started a career as a corrections officer and rose to become corrections commissioner under Mayor Koch and currently is a lawyer in Brooklyn whose practice includes criminal law. Michael, uh, Michael Jacobson, who heads CUNY's Institute for State and Local Governments, has been commissioner of both the city's corrections and probation department and headed the Vera Institute of Justice and is a member of, 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 of the commission headed by Judge Lipman. Ronald Day is the vice president of the, of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society, an organization of ex-offenders. And Ruben Blau is a reporter for the Daily News, has been covering the corrections crisis and will, tell, and will tell us what it all means. Ruben, let me start with you. Just kind of give us a little scene setter. How did we get to this point where you have all this attention on corrections? Sure. Thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me and really uh, flattered to be here uh, along with the two correction commissioners and former commissioners and one of the top uh, advocates in the city. Uh, one of the big issues is over the last 10, 15 years uh, has been the sort of the rise in violence uh, in jail. Uh, at the same time, uh, several high profile inmate deaths, uh, including Bradley Ballard, who um, literally, you know, uh, baked to death in his cell uh, due to some issues on, on the, in, in the facility. Uh, so there's been a lot of attention in, on Rikers Island about what they should do and how to stop the violence. And even though at the same time over the last you know, five to ten years, the population has actually drastically decreased. Um, Jackie, you, you actually have seen this as a corrections officer as well as a, uh, um, and the, and the, as, as well as a commissioner. And, and the first discussion of closing Rikers actually happened when you were commissioner under, under Mayor Koch. Yes, it was. I, I think that the mayor put together, again, a task force that took a look at it, and um, the... Uh, it was decided that Rikers, it was untenable to think about closing Rikers. Because? Because, there's, first of all, the to place the inmates in the city, in boroughs, is going to cause just what the Mayor de Blasio is concerned about. But more than that, it's just easier to park all those buses. You have cars. You have where are all the offices are going to park. We went through every possible scenario. And we ended up closing borough prisons because it was just not working for the department. It's easier to have them in close proximity to transportation and get them to court on time, and that can be done. The BQE is not an impossible run when you, when you get there at the right time. Uh, we, I, the uh, Herb Sturridge did it, mm -hmm. and I worked very closely with him in laying out the issues that needed to be addressed. And there were 
It was one borough, Manhattan has a borough that's attached directly to the courthouse. And the classification was to put those inmates who needed to be in the court you know, and were on trial in that facility, which made life easier. And it's easy if you classify inmates. So the decision was made not to close uh, Rikers, but to build some <coughs> facilities on Rikers and to improve the roads and improve the parking for staff. I mean, do you imagine what you would do with all of the staff that now works on Rikers trying to park, have them park somewhere in Brooklyn or the Bronx mm -hmm. or Manhattan? So it really was a, was it's a, a practical, practical a consider. very practical uh, decision not to close Rikers. Uh, you've been around this business for an awful long time, Mike. What's changed? Why is there this focus on, you know, even at a time when the number of inmates has dropped so drastically from around 20,000 10 years ago, 15 years ago, to it's now under 10,000 on, on Rikers? I think it's a combination of a few things. I mean, first of all, there is a, a sort of national moment when both the sort of left and right are kind of coming together, agreeing that there's a criminal justice system. These right, are on, right on crime. Right on crime. Right. You Newt Gingrich. I mean, there's a there's a... Uh, a lot John, of high profile and, and John Kasich is involved in that movement. Yeah, as yeah. Well. Yes. So it, so it, so it's a moment for reform nationally. Um, in the city, I think it's it's both that moment. Uh, there's been, as you pointed out in your opening, a series of sort of high profile incidents, which has really um, caused a lot of attention to Rikers. I mean, you mentioned some of the violent incidents, the deaths, um, and I think you know for those of us who've been around for a while and. Jackie and the mayor are raising all sorts of real obstacles. Um, you know, but part of the problem with Rikers is that it is a penal colony, and its, it's, its infrastructure can never be bought up to a great standard. It's, it's just the buildings are too old, there's not enough money, and so the thought of getting off Rikers is attractive, um, and I think one of the things the commission will look at, and we're actually looking at it in uh, our institute here at CUNY, is how would you overcome those obstacles, whether it's cost, practicality, where would you build, how would you do it? Because at least theoretically, you'd like to have folks who are arrested, as you mentioned, pre-trial, they're detainees, they're not guilty of anything. Ideally, best practice is to have them in the neighborhoods that they're from, to have connections for them and their family, to make it easier for people to visit them, to have them closer to the court, to the courts. That's all easy for me to say. You'd have to figure out, and this is what the commission's challenge will be, how could you get there in a way that's doable and not just theoretical? Doable fiscally as well as policy-wise. Correct, and politically. Ronald, um, you, uh, you, you spent time on Rikers Island in a way that... Jackie did that. That Jackie did not, as as an as as, as an ex-offender. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have quite so much overcrowding, but there's such high levels of mental illness. Forty percent of the inmates on on Rikers come in with a with a designation of a of a uh, mental illness, some kind of a mental mental disability. You have the gang culture. Um, does the fact that this is a penal colony feed that feed that culture? I would say so. And let me just say, the Fortune Society is not an organization of ex-offenders. We're an organization that provides services I'm to sorry. people that have been uh, uh, in conflict with the criminal justice system. And so, yeah, so the fact that, is a, that it is a penal colony, that you have uh, thousands of people languishing in this space that are mostly idle, so limited number of services that are actually available to them. So, that, I mean, that poses a challenge. I mean, there's... People get frustrated, you know, they supposed to go back and forth to court at times, you know, there's delays in that process, you know, people have low bails that they can't afford often. And so, you know, if a family member can't afford to bail them out, I mean, that's a challenge. So, and of course, the gang culture is prevalent on Rikers Island. I was there in 1992 when the bloods actually started. And so, I mean, from that time to now, the gangs are very prolific. And so, I mean, there are attempts to try to address this issue, but oftentimes it's done through what was described already, trying to contain the violence by instituting violence. Mm. And we know that that doesn't work. <coughs> um, Ruben, talking about, I mean, I think that brings it to, to, you know, you were discussing some of these uh, specific incidents, which is both between inmates and between, and, and the higher level of attention has actually been on between the staff. Um, and, you know, if you look at the mayor's management report, there has been an uptick in the number of uh, in the number of violent incidents involving 
um, both inmates and staff on inmates. Is that a trend that, that is, is getting attention? Is that part of the motivation? You know, that's, a good, that's a good question. I think what's happening also is, you know, according to the unions and you know, the supervisors that are in the, the rank and file, one of the biggest issues is, is they're, they're stepping away from solitary confinement as a punishment uh, and the use of solitary confinement. And that's actually actually happening on a national scale as well. And for the first time you're seeing some of the reaction, I mean, some, you know, the staff feels that because they don't have this option, especially with the younger inmates who are, tend to sort of act out as more, um, that that is creating some of the issue, that they know that the punishment doesn't exist as much as more, so they are acting out uh, in that way. Um, you know, it depends who you ask. Like, the advocates will say, you know, this is just, you have a, a sort of a, the population that exists now also, because it's a smaller population, is generally there for sort of more violent crimes, and that's also leading to some of the violence. Um, and I, I think really what the number one issue is, is the, and, and you mentioned this before, is the mental illness. Um, you know, the number 40% has been tossed out a lot. Uh, it's really unclear. They can't kind of figure out exactly how many people there are actually mentally ill. And the care for them, uh, you know, it's a real challenge. They've opened up several specialized units to give them sort of a really extreme care with a lot of social work uh, and programs and things like that. But it's just really just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it barely, barely handles, um, you know, the sheer number. Uh, and, you know, people say that it's really kind of turned into a dumping ground for, you know, mentally ill. Uh, and a lot of them are, are people who have small, you know, who commit sort of uh, low-level offenses, have high, you know, high amounts of bail, and spend, you know, weeks if not months in Rikers Island and dealing with officers who have no idea how to handle or, are, you know, have never been trained or not, don't, do not know how to handle that. Yeah, that, that. That's very critical. That classification, the, the management of a jail requires strict and strong classification of inmates. Not every inmate needs the level of custody that everybody gets. Mm -hmm. And so that's one of the problems, it really knowing who the inmates are. Inmates are not unknown. They come in with a history, they come in with some priors, they come in with, if they haven't, then you know something about them. You can find out about inmates. They're not secret people. And so one of the things that, that, that concerns me often is how, who are they classifying and how are they classifying inmates? The mentally ill, uh, there are different degrees of mentally ill. Mm -hmm. And they require different kinds of classification, different kinds of care. And if that doesn't happen, you're going to have a confusion. Officers don't know what they're doing, but if you train officers to work with this group, and you, train, you can't train them to work universally, I mean, well, that would be too costly. So, but there are different degrees of mental illness, and you have to classify those inmates so that the officers can be trained to deal with those inmates. It's very difficult, but it can be done. It has been done. Violence is not new in jail. It's just that the public is listening now. You are reporting it. Uh, it has always been a violent place, but it was less violent when inmates are classified carefully, when inmates are isolated carefully. You don't isolate everybody because they spit at you. Uh, that's really what happens. But classification is critically important. And whether you move it to Bronx or Brooklyn or leave it on Rikers, if you don't classify inmates carefully, you're going to end up with a kind of violence. And I suspect it's going on now. It's just unmanageable. Uh, one of the points you raised about uh, younger inmates is New York is one of the only is one of the last two states, the other one being North Carolina, where 16 and 17 year olds are treated as adults in the, in the criminal justice system. It's kind of frankly a disgrace for this supposedly progressive state of ours that we still treat youngsters. And, you know, when you put a 17 year old together with a 29 year old, those are very different. So, I mean, one of the first ends of uh, solitary was, in fact, you cannot put 16 and 17 year olds anymore, as, as, as I understand, in solitary. Um, what about these tools? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the 16 and 17 year old issue is, is a huge issue, as you say. We are only one of two states that treat 16 and 17 year olds as adults. Um, and, but even beyond that, you know, there's a huge population of young adults who are older than, right. you know, 18, 19, 20. One of the things that's happened in the city is that uh, on the good news front, as I think Reuven said, there's been a huge decrease in the population since Jackie and I were there. I mean, the, the population peaked maybe when um, <laughs> the Jackie was there and around... 21, 22,000. Now we're about 10. Well, that was also with the height of the crack epidemic. Less than 10. Oh, yeah, right, absolutely. Right, so right. Uh, the good news is we have less than half the population we used to. The bad news is, uh, as you said, people are there both 
um, for more serious crimes. But also one of the issues, and this is, you know, it's a little inside baseball, but people are staying there much, much longer. So the times to disposition uh, for felonies, for example, have increased from 100 days to 200 days. Jails are not built to hold people for that kind of time. They in fact, just so you know, I looked, at the, I looked at the mayor's management report. There were over 400 people being held in the correction system yeah. over two years. Right. And, and six people are there, are, are, there, are, are there for six years. Yeah. It's a huge problem. And, you know, you could always find a couple of cases where it's understandable because they're so complicated, you know. But, but as a general proposition, jails are, you stay there a short period of time, you're treated humanely and fairly, and you move on to wherever you're going, whether it's prison, you're back out on the street going home, you're on probation, wherever you are, the goal is to get you there quickly and safely. Once so you're everybody... staying 100, 200, 300 days, that has a direct relationship to violence, to officer safety, to inmate safety. It's a very big problem. Um, I mean, just so everybody understands, I mean, there are three categories of people being held on Rikers. There's uh, pretrial detainees, there's parole violators, and there's people who've been sentenced to less than a year in prison. I believe that's, I believe that's, that's correct. correct. Right. And if you're sentenced to more than a year, then you go into the state prison system. Correct. So... Um, this idea of being of being held, and uh, you know, I want to go back to this kind of culture. Mm -hmm. You know, not only it's you know, it's more than just gangs. There's a <coughs> there's obviously a dehumanizing uh, quality to being in being to crime. being in prison. Mm -hmm. You know, even whether you're guilty or you're not guilty mm -hmm. of the offense, there's a dehumanizing quality. Yeah, yeah. Of, of the reality is that though, as you know, the 85 percent of the folks that are there are there as pre -trial. detainees pre-trial, and a small percentage of there for parole violations. Mm -hmm. So the reality is that, again, when you confine people in these spaces and there's not a lot of movement on Rikers Island, I mean, you might be able to go f to the law library, you might be able to go to recreation, but beyond that, that's it. So you're confined in this really small space you're for in, a significant in, amount of time. You're in jail, right. For a significant amount of time. I mean, when people go to prison, the prison has... You know, so many acres, you move about the place, and there's a lot more to do. Inside of Rikers Island, again, very limited movement. And as Michael said, the idea is not to keep people housed there for a significant amount of time. So 1,500 people there for two years. I mean, that is entirely too long to have somebody languishing in jail, right? Pre-trial. Pre-trial, mostly because they can't afford bail. Right. And think of what that, I mean, that's tough for anyone, what, 16, 17, 18-year-old exactly. kids yeah. old kids With 21-year-olds? Yeah. And sitting around with nothing to do? Exactly. And the 21-year-old and egging him on? I mean, exactly. hormones all over the place? Exactly. Yeah. It, it becomes, it just becomes untenable. And the correction officer, the, what does he or she do? Right. I mean, you, you don't have any way to divert their attention. Yeah, right. Well, because if, if you are a pretrial detainee, you cannot be required to go into any of the kind of programming, a, there is a lot of programming offered, offered within the you know you know within the institution. But if you're a pretrial detainee, you can't be forced to go into that. But why wouldn't they go? The question would be, why wouldn't they go? Well, because of the culture. <laughs> because of the culture. Well, in the and that's my point. Yeah. I mean, if you have five kids who all want to go to the law library and they live together and they they, they look around and they say, well, we're going to go no matter what. But he had one kid who wants to go to the, and he's trying to impress, you know, yeah. the older guy. He says, why are you going to the, what, well, you think he's going? Mm -hmm. And so that's the reason this whole business of putting like, you know, it's like, you know, you, you put all like oranges together. Why wouldn't you do that? And what, and, and, I, and I suspect, and it was, I don't think jailing is any different today than it was when I was there as a correction officer and tried to make it better when I was a career commissioner. But it was, it's a matter of people needing to be safe and they do what they need to be safe in that in space, in that environment. And, you know, I disagree, Michael, that Rikers could have an excellent outdoor program. That's yeah. one of the things that made Rikers, um, maybe they put buildings on them now, on that open space. But we used to, the first Roadrunner activity in New York, you know, the, uh, what is it called? The marathon, marathon. Was done on Rikers Island. There's plenty of space. The problem is that we put a fence around it, and you remember the fence. You can't get out of that fence. There haven't been escapes from Rikers in forever. It was one four years ago. Well, one. In all of those years <laughs> that that fence went up, and I would like to know how that, if I were commissioner, how that happened. It would never happen again. <laughs> but after, what, 15 years, nobody got out, 20 years? 
because the space is available. But maybe they put some, and I haven't, I don't go to Rikers that often, almost never. But the, the, uh, one of the benefits of Rikers is it does have space. And the prison population is one half of what it was when I was commissioner. And we were able to take all those people and give them some rec. You were take, able to take all of them and give them, unless you were confined, and even those that got confined were, were given some activity. But you can't have people closed in, locked in, <coughs> confined in, in an environment where everybody is looking over their shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then you have the gangs, and I can't imagine what it's like with the gangs. And we, now, it must be just horrible. Mm -hmm. But again, those people are human beings as well. That's right. And they can be managed. I do believe that human beings can be managed in that environment. That's right. I mean, when you offer the recreational and therapeutic program, then more than likely people are interested in those services. Fortune, Fortune Society yeah. does programming yeah. on Rikers, yeah. doesn't it? So we go in and we offer discharge planning to people that are gonna be transitioning into the community. And so we talk to them about the services that are available to them, and we try to make sure that they have the continuity of care that's important for people, because when you, when you reach them on Rikers Island, then there's a greater likelihood that they will continue to come to access the services that are oftentimes essential for them to kind of stay on the right track. And Jackie's right. If you have, I think, I think as a sort of historical matter, there were probably more programs at Rikers when Jackie and I were there than there are now. And I know Joe Pons, who's the commissioner, is very focused on this, right? He and the mayor are very focused on getting more programs. Because if you have programs, um, people will use them, right? I mean, they will absolutely take advantage of them. And I agree with you about the outdoor stuff. When I was there, we had a very big, we had both a farm program, a very big program at the New York Horticultural Society. Those, those inmates love those programs. Yeah, you get to be outside, you can do something, you can actually learn a skill and transfer to employment on the outside. So no, it's definitely doable. It's both a, a sort of resource issue and, and creating that capacity. And again, I, I think Joe, Pont is very focused on dealing with that idle time. Again, I, I, it'll, I'll beat this dead horse a little, especially, it, and I know Judge Littman is going to be very focused on the length of time people are there, but if they're for weeks and weeks and weeks, stretching into months, occasionally years. But that has to do with bail reform. I mean, but that people are hit with bails. That they bail could be five hundred right. bucks, and you and you and you can't make it. There's two issues. One is bail reform. You're right, because there are thousands of people there who can't make two five hundred dollar, thousand dollar bail. But also, even and for bail the, is going to be returned to you if you show up in court. That's correct. what bail is. And, it's not like and bail most people do show right. up in court. Yes. But the other issue is even aside from bail, just the regular court process. Once you're there, there's going to be some people who are there either because there's no bail because they remand it or the bail is so insanely high they're not Because of the it. nature of the offense. But, you know, one of the cornerstones of our justice system is the speedy disposition of cases. It may be a serious case. It may be a violent charge. But you have a right to a speedy and fair trial. There's no earthly reason why in a civilized society we have to keep someone in jail for 10 months to dispose of a misdemeanor or even a felony case. Or more time that they would actually serve if they were convicted. Sometimes, in but even if they're going to ultimately do a, a bit in state prison, and mm -hmm. a much, much lower number now do that coming, but if, even if they're doing that, they should get there quickly. They should not hang around jails for months and months at a time. But we also know that when people end up languishing in jail, that they are more likely to plead guilty Correct. than if they are released. If they are released on bail or on their own recognizance, they have a better chance of being successful with their case. Because when you're, when you're in jail, you want to get out. You want to get out. And so sometimes whether you're guilty or innocent is inconsequential. The fact of the matter is you want to get out, you have a job that might be out there that you are going to lose or, you know, other circumstances. And so it's like when an offer comes, it's like, listen, I need to accept this offer. So there's too much of the fact that a person is on Rikers or in a jail and can't afford to get out that influences the fact that the person ends up pleading guilty. Um, we did a story, and just on the, on the inmates staying there a long time, I did a story about a year ago. We got a list of the inmates, like the top 100 inmates who have been there the longest. There's actually somebody there for seven years. It's a murder trial in the Bronx. And a lot of the cases were out of the Bronx, which is sort of notorious for, you know, the right. court system, the DA. 
Um, but one of the things that also kind of popped up on some of these inmates who were there for a long time was a bunch had continually missed their court cases, like their court dates. For whatever reason, like it was clearly some kind of an illness or like just kind of didn't want to face the music. You know, they were just, they were not being brought to court. And I think technically you're allowed to sort of make sure the inmate's brought to court or the judge is allowed to kind of continue on without the inmate. Just, just, just not happening. It just wasn't happening in these Except cases. Except that the city spends $25 million a year transporting mm -hmm. people from Rikers to the various courthouses around, you know, around the city. And the Bronx District Attorney, uh, Ms. Clark, I believe is her name, the new, the, new the new district attorney, is talking about posting uh, assistant, you know, assistant district attorneys on Rikers and possibly even moving a courtroom onto Rikers Island in order to cut down on that time. Because, you know, when I talk to defense lawyers, uh, legal aid lawyers, you know, how much time do they wait sitting around waiting for their client to show up? So, I mean, with all due respect to the to your view of the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, it's, um, you know, it's kind of, like the, uh, you know, it's like the Long Island Expressway light. No, I actually, uh, <laughs> I, I don't think that you will find the judges saying that just because my inmates don't get here ever. There are times when, well, I, I do some criminal law. There's times when you can't find the inmate. Mm -hmm. I mean, on the island, anywhere. I mean, right. some of the Brooklyn is open, and you know, the, right. The Brooklyn House of Detention is actually system. connected to the court that's system, right. right? And so you can through find underground it there. tunnels, right? But, but you know, that's that's not the issue. The issue is to get back to this issue. When an inmate is on Rikers, and you know where, and you don't know where he is, there's something that says something about the system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, maybe the inmate doesn't want to be found. Maybe the inmate doesn't want to face the music. But eventually, we talked about having a, I'm sure that was not anything new when you came on, Mike, that we were always attempting to put a jail, uh, I mean, a court system on Rikers. They were going to do it by Skype. I think one of the chief judges even approved it. It was pre-Skype that you were going to, and there may have been even some project doing that, because that makes a lot of sense. If you have a misdemeanor, why are you trucking him all the way to the Bronx right. when he's going to have a bench trial? Right. Why? And then what, my better question is, why is he still in jail if his bail is $250? Wouldn't it be cheaper just to pay his bail and put him on some kind of minor probation, which your people are already doing? Right. And so there are just creative ways of reducing the population. We had to do that. I mean, there were 20,000 people in a jail that had, what, 12,000 beds? And so we were able to manage. And the level of violence wasn't nearly this much. Why? Because the, there was movement. The but but also, the but, uh, but also, the gang culture was not as entrenched mm -hmm. as it is as it is now. Right? Well, you had a different kind. You had the. Uh, I don't know whether you were reporting. We put together a, um, a specialized unit in the Brooklyn House, where the worst of the worst didn't even want to go, and I laugh about it now because you just put all the gangs there. They want to be together, so just open the Brooklyn House and put them all together. I mean, why are you dispersing them? And I don't know that they're not all together. But they are cells. Do you know what I mean? You can't put gang people in dormitories. Mm -hmm. you, you just have to have that. Again, I hate to keep beefing about classification, but you have to no. know who your inmate is and what he's liable to do. And you do have some history about it. Very few inmates have, this is my first time. And the first timers, that <coughs> are critically important that you classify them and keep them away because you don't want to contaminate them or harm them. And so one of the things that uh, you, you think about when you're worrying about getting them to court, on some of the low-level misdemeanors, why do you need them in court? The judge could be right on Rikers. Who is the, who, the district attorney? Who is the complainant? It would be easier to get the complainant if you need it to Rikers or get them on the Skype. They're going to say the same thing. They just, the technology has never been embraced by corrections. And it has been tried. I must think it was Morgenthau who may have tried it. I'm not too sure. But anyway, somebody wanted to do that back when I was not even a commissioner. I was probably in the academy, which was five years before I became commissioner, that that was tried. They wanted to do that. It just never got off the ground. With today's technology, taking people that really are just going for a hearing to court. For is, a five-minute hearing. For five, is, is a waste of time. No, I agree. And, you know, idea, again, ideally, and we had these same discussions about having court parts on Rikers and always the obstacles you run into 
Jackie's right, the technology is so much more advanced than when I was there, and it wasn't that long ago. When you were um, there with carbon paper. Right? Uh, yeah, more, more, yeah, and white Parchment. Yeah, exactly. Parchment, right. Exactly. Um, the, uh, but you, know, you run into all these practical issues. To have an actual court part, you have to have judges mm -hmm. out there. You have to have DAs and the defense bar. And, of course, no one want, you know, none away. of those folks want, want to do that. Mm -hmm. So you either have to get a way to make them do it, or find the technology where people can live with, you know, the defense will always argue, I, I, have, to, I have to be there, you know, that uh, technology isn't good enough, I need to be with my client, and I get that at some level, but Jackie's right, you know, the process of getting people, this has not changed, from the island to court is a brutal process. You know, you wake them up at four in the morning, they come down, you sort of take them on this trip, and even when you get there, Reuven, it's, to me, when I was there, the issue was less that, you know, because our on-time delivery rate back in the day was always in the high 90s. It was, I think the figure was when I was there, for everyone we brought down to court every day, 30% of them never made their court appearance. That's yes, exactly. Right? And that had nothing to do with corrections. It's because, you know, judge's calendaring system was off or they ran late, they couldn't, and so... A, it's incredibly inefficient, and B, just picture being the guy who has right, to right. do that, spend getting all jerked day around, right. getting jerked around, and then getting jerked around right. a week right. later when it, when it happens again. It's a big problem. So if ideally those people, for a low-level offense, who shouldn't be there, or they should get out quickly, or you should use technology. Um, but there is a certain attractiveness to once they're on Rikers, for whatever reason, Having a court on Rikers would be a fabulous idea, but it's like, you know, you have to deal with the same issues they have to think about for closing Rikers. There are just a lot of legitimate um, practical issues that you'd have to overcome to do it. When we were talking, when we were talking before the show, we were talking about corrections officers, and, the, and uh, in, in particular, Mr. Seabrook, the Correction Officer Benevolent Association president, who has been doing these ads talking about the toughest precincts in New York City, and you were making the point that you think that that's a counterproductive point of view. I do. Why is that? Explain that. Do you know who's looking at the ball game at 7 o'clock at night? When those ads run. Yeah. When those ads run? They're inmates. That's what they do. That's all they have to do. And they're being told that they're living in the toughest precinct in the city of New York? Um, really? And you think it feeds into the culture of, of violence. It kind of it reinforces it. Of course it does. I mean, you have to <coughs> hear it. And I, I, I attempted to speak to Mr. Seabrook, but I, we, we didn't connect. But the ad says that we, are the, we have the toughest precinct in the city of New York. Well, not everybody there is the toughest person. Not everybody there is a violent offender. Not everybody. Those, these kids, some of these men and women are going to go home the next day, God forbid. Hmm? And they have lived in the toughest precinct. I mean, they, what, I am, it, I understand what he's trying to say. And it is a very difficult job. It is a tremendously difficult job. It's a hard job and it takes courage to do that job. But at the same time, you are announcing to the environment, to the community, that this place is horrible. That these are terrible people and not everybody there is terrible. Not everybody has committed a heinous crime. Some people just don't have bail. They have children at home. They have wives and mothers. And jobs. And jobs. And some of them are construction workers, for instance, and they are day laborers. They get jobs if they're out. Mm -hmm. And so the, 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 the ad is, I think, counterproductive for the inmate. And whether it bolsters the correction officers is seen is another story. That's not my issue. The issue is that we, my job as a correction officer was to make sure that inmates were safe, that the jail would be a, a place where when people left, they, you know, they weren't harmed. They used to say, you know, do no harm. And so to tell the world that this is the toughest precinct in the world and the people who are there are the most horrible people in the world to me, is not productive. Is that, uh, it's kind of also a cultural, you know, it's also a cultural comment in terms of, uh, do you think <coughs> that those ads have a role? I mean, is it, or is that just kind of one more factor? Well, I haven't seen the ad, but I just think generally. Uh, he, well, he generally calls, yeah. 
calls, you know, corrections officers yeah, that they, toughest. you know, one of the that's one of the taglines of the ad, and, and it's and as you know, I've seen it many times. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the one thing that we have to ask ourselves is, do the jails need to be as violent as they are? And I think that the answer is no. Well, but the, but but then the question becomes, how do you? You know, how do you control that? Is it by separating people? Yeah. Is it by segregating people? Yeah. Well, so, look, Andrew. No. So, I mean, there's. We talked already about ensuring that people are not just idle, not having much to do while they're there, because that kind of promotes this this idea that I'm just here. I'm going to get frustrated during the time that I'm here, and I don't have any incentives for me to not act out in a way that's negative. And then, again, you house people together. You know, it's, it's, almost like it, it's almost like a, it, it almost becomes a status symbol. Yeah, and I mean, the reality is there. I mean, you talk about a lot of young people there. You talk about a lot of the violence that brews because of that. But, I mean, when you when you house people there, and as, as you said, based upon classification, I mean, you almost facilitate involvement in gangs. Because if a person is in a situation where he feels... What am I going to do to protect myself while I'm here? Because has, this is a pretty violent place. Who has place. my back? Who, who has, has my back? I mean, that's a, any one of us who were put in a situation like this, we'd ask ourselves, who are we going to align ourselves with? Am I going to, to be kind of solo, trying to ensure that I just get out of here as quickly as possible? Or am I going to make sure, as you said, that somebody has my back, that I'm protected, that I'm not robbed, that I'm not hurt? I mean, those things are key questions for people that are going to be housed for whatever time that they're going to be on Rikers. I, mean, I think one of the things, and again, you know, the, the, Joe Pont, who's the commissioner, is, I mean, he's a very experienced guy. He's he came out around, of Maine, right? Uh, correct, but, he's, right. He, but he worked in a lot. He, right. he came from uh, Running Maine, Maine, but, he, but he's, he's run a lot of systems. Um, he's a good corrections professional. It's not like he doesn't understand these mm -hmm. issues, and he's working, I think, really hard on them. The, you know, the, the issue about whether it's jails or prisons, but jails specifically, the only reason... Explain the difference between a jail and a prison. Well, a, a, a jail is, as you said, primarily, and this is not just true in New York, primarily jails are used to house pretrial detainees while you're going through the core process. Or short sentence. Or short-term stayers. And then there's, you know, all jails have some number of people who are sentenced, but not sentenced to more than a year. In Texas, yeah. Prisons are the, than, are the It's more are than the two longer, years. Right. Pris prisons are, you have a felony conviction, you're going to serve more than a year, you go to prison. But the only reason you should be a pretrial detainee in any jail system is for one of two reasons. Either there's reason to believe you will not appear for your court appearance, or, and we don't have the statute here, or... In, in other states because we believe you're an imminent risk to public safety. Mm -hmm. If you do not meet those criteria, if we believe you will come back and you do not pose a public safety threat, you should not be in jail mm -hmm. as a pretrial detainee. You should be out, and ideally not even on bail, right? Because there's no relationship to money bail and showing up to your appearance, right? You can have very high bail set because you killed five people, if you happen to have a lot of money, you'll you get, get out, right. right? So, you know, j jail is a very expensive, potentially punitive um, and harmful sanction. So you want to use it parsimoniously. You don't want to default to jail. You want to have the number of people you, you need to have only because you believe they won't come back and or they're going to they're, harm, they're gonna harm someone. And, th and that's all you should have. And even those folks should cycle through quickly and get to wherever they're going to get. Because, as Jackie said, it is, you know, I, I was very fond of the staff when I was there. There are correction officers who do a great job. It's a very difficult job. Yeah. One of the reasons they, they rebel against, against being called guards Right? Is it's, you know, it conjures up images of people who just open and close doors all day long. I mean, think of, think of the mass of humanity they have to deal with. People who are mentally ill, young kids who are born out of their mind, kid, people coming in off the street who are high on drugs. It's a very, to do it well, it's not about using force. It's, it's about dealing with a variety of human behaviors to both calm people down, get them from here to here, treat them safely. That is a tough job.
It, it, really, it, it actually is. And, and a good correction officer, again, I was just talking to the, the, my colleague here. One of the things that I had trouble finding out when I was preparing for this was the number of days that an in, average days that an inmate <coughs> stays on Rikers pretrial. It just wasn't doing it. And so, one, so when I couldn't find it, I was a little, and I kept Googling and looking, and I couldn't find it. And, but that suggests something to me, that those numbers, how you look at your population depends on what you have. You really do have to have a measure. 40% of the mentally ill, not all of them are sick. Very, so it's you, very different. Very I different. think it's 10 percent are seriously mentally. Right. Ill. So those 10 percent, get them right away. Put them somewhere. Give them the services, the highest level of service that you can provide, and try to get them out on bail. They are just. I mean, but that requires knowledge about the population, and I suspect this commission will do that. The problem is that in order to manage a jail, you have to know what you have in your jail. You cannot just open the door and throw them in. You know, you have the carpenter, the baker, you have the father, you have. So you, you really do have to know. So if you have 40 percent mentally ill, you have 60 percent of people who are pretrial. How many of them are on the way to state prison? Those men who are on the way to state prison want no trouble. Put them. So it's, it's this whole this cherry picking of people that's so critically important. Yeah. And if you don't, you're going to have the kind of violence. The, the jails weren't always not violent when, when we were there. There were violence, but you addressed it in a way that minimized it. Some people come in there to fight. They just don't know any other. So find them, you know, get them quickly. Because jail is just like anything else. Most people who go to jail are going to go home. Mm -hmm. They're all going to go back to your community. They're going to go back home. They're not all going to go upstate. So what do we leave and send back to the community? Somebody who's cut, slashed. The correction officer was slashed. I don't think I've ever seen such a slashing. It's away from your microphone. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen such a slashing yeah. up close. But who is that inmate? Mm -hmm. And how did that inmate get to that point? Don't we want to know about that inmate and find out who he is? Because there must be others like him. And so what do we do with them? So part of what we need to, what we look at when we are, um, you know, in charge of jails and prisons is who do we have in our population? And to leave a mentally ill person pre-trial in Rikers or in any prison without having him do some movement it's going to cause trouble. I would just add, too, that a lot of times the focus is on the mentally ill. The, if there's harm that happens from a mentally ill person, usually it's to himself, generally. Another thing that we haven't talked about is the cost. I mean, not just the cost financially. I mean, 112000 or so is what Scott Stringer put out a year. I mean, the New York Times said 167000 But if it costs $100,000 or more to house a person on Rikers, that is absurd. I mean, so that's part of the reason why the left and the right have been coalescing around criminal justice reform, primarily because of the cost. But for us, it's that it's the, the issue of dignity, that a person should not, should not have to reside on Rikers Island, again, just because they can't afford to. Let me, you know, this whole debate happens at a, at a much broader, you talked about the right-left. I mean, there is a, a coming together of people on the right wing and people mm -hmm. kind of progressive criminal justice reformers. And whether the right-wingers are because they think it's, you know, they want to bust corrections unions or they want to uh, save money, or they believe in the in Christian redemption, or or they or they believe in the inherent redeemability of people. Whatever it is, you have this this coming together in the issue. It also you also see it in things like going back to the you know going back to Melissa Mark Viverito, uh, decriminalizing very very minor offenses. You know, uh, public urination is the one that kind of got the got all the attention. But there's a lot of very minor offenses that are, that they're trying to take out of the criminal system and put them into the kind of violation system. So that's, I mean, that's definitely, you know, been talked about a lot and it's, you know, kind of in motion. Uh, and I guess one of the frustrations, you know, as a reporter is that, you know, as much as the talk has been going on, that some of these problems still continue. Just this month, uh, you know, I did a story about an inmate who was in Rikers for stealing a phone and he stole a phone at Dunkin' Donuts in Manhattan somewhere and his bail was set at $750 because he had some priors and whatnot, and he had serious mental illness issues. He had, like, his prior stay in Rikers Island, he had tried to commit suicide. Mm. I mean, to the point where they literally had to kind of cut him down. Mm. And he came in, and 
they nobody apparently kind of looked through the record or they did and didn't really feel it necessary to put him into like a mental observation unit. Uh, they flagged him to be seen for a full analysis, uh, like a full psych analysis within 72 hours. And on his 70th hour, he committed suicide. And, uh, you know, and this is just this month. I mean, we're talking about, you know, there's constantly talk about like a speaker about changing the system. Um, and here you go, like a classic example. You know, there's all this attention on Rikers Island and this stuff just keeps on happening. I mean, it just, it just, on a personal level, it's just, it's just this absolute frustration that, you know, it's just a system-wide failure. The bail's high, you know, he can't, you know, he's 23 years old. He's obviously sort of does not appear to be sort of a violent offender. He comes in, you know, there's a misclassification as he comes in. And then, you know, when he's there, he doesn't, he's not seen. He actually missed an appointment because the jail was on lockdown. So he, he's not seen right away. And, and this, you know, and then he's not watched carefully. And this happens. So, you know, I mean, there's a lot of talk. And I think, it, you know, it's headed in the right direction. I think, you know, it depends on kind of who you ask, obviously. You know, I think the com police commissioner has, you know, sort of a different opinion about it. But, you know, it's a, it's a process. And it's a long, long process. Let me take a, uh, tell, us, tell us your name and your campus and ask your question, please. My name is Jasmine from Baruch College, and my question is, will there ever be major prisoner reduction in New York State when so many upstate counties depend on the revenues from those prisons? Well, that's a very interesting question. The state system is a different system. I did some work in my, you know, I, I'm not a real TV, you know, I just play a TV <laughs> commentator on TV. And one of the things I worked with was with a group that was, that was involved in juvenile justice reform. And... When Governor Cuomo came in, in his first state of the state, he said that corrections is not a jobs program and because you do have this. Um, and I think that's partly the reaction of the correction officers union to the calls, you know, concern for the jobs of their members. If, you know, if you close down Rikers, what happens to that? You know, what happens to the jobs? I mean, to what degree is, you know, are corrections officers like anybody else? I don't mean to be uh, putting down... Is there a special interest thing going on here? Well, there's a number of special interests. And, you know, to address your question, you know, again, the good news is the state prison, the New York state prison system is the fastest shrinking prison system in the United States. It's, it's down by about 27 or 28 percent from its high about 12 years ago. The bad news is that's all from New York City sending fewer people to prison, right? So the upstate counties, as you mentioned, didn't didn't really contribute to that increase. And the politics around prisons is always, when you get down to it, le certainly on a state level, less about you know left and right, Democrat, Republicans, than upstate, downstate, right? Upstate communities, as you say, sort of fight for prisons the way, the way cities fight for the Olympics. Well, right? prisoners, prisoners upstate are counted for, for, re, for redistricting purposes, right. you can count them as a citizen right. even exactly. if they can't vote. Yeah. And so, so you get how, you know, it kind of distorts exactly. right. so there's the all, political again, power. Again, to me, state. those are obstacles to prison reform or prison reduction, but none of them are insurmountable. But you have to recognize that, that upstate counties see these things as economic development. They never provide the economic development people think. There are a hundred ways to provide better economic development. But I, but I think the answer to your question is, there can be, in terms of upstate counties, whether it's New York or anywhere else, but you do need a very concerted sort of strategic effort to, to get that and address. There are some real issues in those counties um, that well, there shouldn't, aren't a lot be, of jobs that shouldn't be addressed by prisons, but they do need economic development. You just have to develop alternative strategies that are not about prisons, but that can be about tech corridors or a variety of I just things. want to add one point to that also. You know, there's a lot of talk and conversation in New York City about shutdown Rikers. And, you know, you talk to the skeptics or the insiders who kind of follow just the city and the state systems, and people will say, what about shutting down Attica? You know, I mean, right. that place is, you know, has had many problems, you know, if not maybe worse if you look at it from the larger systemic, you know, level. So, I mean, you know, it's a conversation, obviously, that's just not really happening on that level. I want to take another question, but it's... it's it's telling to me, maybe it shouldn't be, but while there's no city officials and no corrections union officials on Judge Lippman's commission, there are real estate people on, on Judge Lippman's commission. You know, I don't know if this carries the possibility of closing Rikers and creating condos, you know, Rikers by the sea or something, but it's a, but you know, <laughs> what happens to Rikers after it's closed? It's also, <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Arlene. I'm uh, from Queens College, and I'm just curious, is the prison system in New York serving any role in rehabilitating the incarcerated, 
or is it only punishing them for their offenses? That's the ultimate debate in corrections, isn't it? That so. is. It is the ultimate debate. Uh, prisons are, as Michael said, the prison, there's a difference between jails and prisons. Jails are short term, a year or less, stay. The reason to have programs there would be to keep a person in sync with his community. Would you, would you rehabilitate him? I don't think it, that would be the issue. The issue would be to continue his life in the community as best you can so that he's not wrenched from the community and has been torn from the community. So rehabilitation isn't something that happens in a jail system. Activities can happen, like the ones at Fortune, which brings him back to the community intact, knowing where he can go, where she can go, in order to reintegrate. Including, in, 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 including substance abuse programs as, programs. as inmates are, are preparing to leave Every the facility. program that they need. Some, are just, some need parenting skills. You know, some men are in jail because they've abused their children. Some need parenting skills. There are many skills that could happen, not rehabilitation, but to assist him in becoming a better citizen. But that costs money, and I don't know what programs they are now because I'm not focused on it. I, I generally representing correction officers who get in trouble. But this is a problem, is that um, people are going back to the community very quickly. The, law, the, the time that they spend in jail is not their lifetime. They're not going upstate. They're going to go back to their communities in Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy, and Harlem. And those skills that got them there, those non-skills or those activities, you could, they can be addressed short-termly. But for rehabilitation, that's not what jails can do. Yeah. And I would say with respect to prisons, just like with the jails, there's been a significant reduction in programming. So vocational program, educational program, college, for example, used to be offered inside of the prisons. But when Pataki was governor, he cut the funding for TAP. That's something that, that advocates are pushing for now. The president has decided he wants to, you know, you've been involved in trying to reinstitute Pell grants for people. So this reality that less programming. I mean, prison has not really been about rehabilitation. It's just not. <coughs> right. I mean, there's an old prison saying few people were ever rehabilitated in prison. Few are still rehabilitated by prison, yet some rehabilitate themselves in spite of prison. So when you go to prison, the reality is that right now it's really about punishment. You're there for like this just desserts type philosophy. You go there, you serve your time. There's not a lot of programming that's offered inside of the facility. You look at people transitioning out of the prisons, they're not transitioning into jobs because they went into a program while they were incarcerated that kind of helped them acquire the training and the skills to be you know, qualified for positions once they get out. It's just not really happening inside the prisons. And I think it's important, Jackie made I think a very important point that's a distinction between jails and prisons. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at jails, even though I was saying there's a, people are staying a lot longer than they used to, you know, when you look at the city jail system, 25% of everyone who goes in is out within 48 hours, mm -hmm. right? 50% are only there for a few weeks. The reality is you're not going to turn people's lives around in a few weeks. Uh, potentially you could do that in prison, but you certainly can't do it in a jail. But what you need to do in a jail is, as we've been saying, keep them safe, give them programs, try to get them to be in a little better place than when they came in. But, you know, serious rehabilitation is not going to happen in a few weeks. And the punishment of both jail or prison is being sent to jail and prison. Once you're there, right, that is the punishment. There shouldn't be more punishment, right? The, the issue of human dignity is incredibly important. If you're in prison, you should be you know, at, you should have programs, you should take advantage of any programs you have, you should be treated with dignity, no matter what you might have done. Um, it sh we should not heap more punishment on you once you're in these places. Being in the place is punishment, punishment. enough. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Emmeth, and I go to John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and my question is, should the city or the state improve background checks on all job applicants in New York for prisons? For corrections officers or as for... As a correction officer, as a employee. Yeah, so they just, I mean, there was a deal, I, the... Um, you know, new administration came in and, you know, as sort of some of this violence is sort of erupting. The new administration meeting with the, the de Blasio. Yeah, right. the de Blasio administration came in and, 
you know, some of this violence was erupting and there was a lot of officers. There seemed to be, I, I don't know anecdotally, I don't know the actual numbers, but there seems to be a lot of officers sort of getting in trouble um, outside, outside the job, inside the job. Um, and there's always been this sort of long standing um, feeling that, uh, you know, some of the violence obviously sort of deals with contraband and fights over, you know, drugs that are coming in or cigarettes now. And that the officers are, are part of that problem. Some of the officers, like a handful of officers, are part of that problem. <coughs> so they, they did a closer look, and uh, DOI, they actually the mayor had uh, like the, the city's department of investigation do sort of a closer look. And they realized that a lot of the hiring that they had done um, under the uh, Commissioner Dora Schreiro and uh, had been really questionable. I mean, they didn't do sort of basic checks on, you know, even like gang affiliations and like gang tattoos. Um, real basic stuff, you know, prior, prior arrest history. And they actually gave the, uh, the commissioner sort of a list of uh, a, large, a large list of officers, I think, you know, maybe close to 100 officers, I believe, who, you know, there was question, questionable hiring and that they should kind of look into. And, and then, you know, there was issues, like what they ended up doing with those officers. Um, you know, it's difficult. They have obviously strong civil service protections, things like that. Um, but it's definitely, you know, of late, especially on New York City, it was like more of an issue. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Wilson. I'm from Queens College. My question is, will the decriminalization of minor offenses in New York City have any real impact on incarceration rates? Well, I mean, you know, probably will the decriminalization of marijuana have, you know, I mean, you know, how many people are there on drug offenses? Which you know, which is why corrections is kind of a, is kind of the end of the road for a whole bunch of other issues. You know, it's how it's how uh, you know it's how government, city, society, deals with things that it hasn't quite figured out how to, how to deal with in any other way. Yeah, there's been a significant amount of net widening over the last 40 years since the 1970s. So there hasn't been the reverse. We have not kind of addressed the fact that the laws have incarcerated the, this number of people where we have 2.3 million people inside now. So we need to address that. Will these laws that are being implemented now actually do it? There's a chance that the numbers could shrink, but the discussions are often about how do you address the fact of the fact that people have nonviolent offenses and people have violent offenses. There has been very <coughs> little discussion about what to do with violent felony offenders. And so everything, if you look at what's happening on the federal level, it's always what do we do with people who have nonviolent crimes? At the end of the day, in order to reduce the prison population, we're really going to have to have in this country a serious conversation about what we do with people that are charged with and convicted of violent crimes. It's arguably, if you remove, or you, you know, you certainly send fewer nonviolent offenders. Uh, it, <coughs> is it is it irrational to say that it allows you to focus more attention on that question? That that is such a waste of psychic and physical resources. We have less than a minute left. I mean, I I, I think that's a very important point Ronald's bringing up because the you know there are people who are in prison, who've committed violent offenses. And, you know, some are incredibly violent, some there's a big range of violence. But the fact is, even for people who have committed violent crimes, you know, mostly when they were young and stupid, we incarcerate them two, three, four, ten times as long exactly. as other countries around the world. Exactly. So I think the issue is not whether you should focus on them or they should be taken from society. It's for how long? Do we have to punish people for 50 years when other countries do it for 10 or 5? I'm going to let you have the last. I have five I have five seconds left on the clock. I'm going to, you have the last word. Thank you all. We'll see you next time. Spirited discussion next time on CUNY Forum. Thank you.